I first heard the story of HMS Thetis from my father, the tragic tale of the submarine that was lost in Liverpool Bay. Found, they got the stern above the water. They could hear the men hammering inside, and yet they couldn't get them out. Now I started looking into doing a video about three unlucky submarines, and when I started looking into Thetis, I realised there was a lot of discrepancies in the accounts that you can find both online and in the books. So I thought I'd look at what those discrepancies are, try and clear them up a little bit. Uh, so let's get into it. Hi, welcome to my little channel and uh, welcome back if it's your, not your first time here. If it is your first time, you're very welcome. HMS Thetis was a, a T-class submarine, one of the first of the T-class submarines, Britain built, expecting the T-class to be the workhorse of the years ahead. And this was in the days just before Britain got involved in World War II. So we're talking about a peacetime accident here. The submarine was on its sea trials, was in Liverpool Bay. It had been built at the Camel, at the Camel Laird shipyard. And when she went to sea in her sea trials, she had her normal complement of crew. She had extra naval pip personnel on board and also people from Camel Laird and people from Vickers as well. And, uh, and two caterers and a pilot. T-class submarine is uh, a submarine with six torpedo tubes in the bow. There are five torpedo tubes on deck, which is something I hadn't been aware of in submarines, that they would put torpedo tubes on deck. Don't know what they ever used, but uh, there were two in the bow, two midships, and one astern on deck. Inside the pressure hull, the submarine had six tubes in the forward compartment. After that was a torpedo storage area. Beyond the torpedo storage area was the general mess area. Um, at the bulkhead in between the torpedo storage area and the mess area, there was an escape compartment. Further back beyond the mess area, the general area where the crew would uh, sleep and eat was the wardroom and beyond that then the control room with a cabin for the captain. After the control room, beyond the wireless and ASDIC area, we had the main engine room where you had the diesel engine and the electric engines. Beyond that again, you had the stokers area. This would have been the uh, stokers mess and some of them would have slept there and you would have had beyond that then the steering gear compartment for the rudder and the, the um, vanes at the back planes, diving planes. Now I've shown the rear escape chamber between the steering compartment and the stoker's mess. If you look at the layout in the book The Admiralty Regrets, which is the first book that was written about this, it shows it forward of the stoker's mess, between the engine room and the stoker's mess. Although all the accounts you will read talk about people entering the escape chamber from the steering gear compartment. And uh, to try and clear up that confusion, I found the plans of a T-class submarine and I've shown the escape chamber lining up with a hatch that's shown in the plans. Uh, that hatch that's shown seems to mirror the hatch for the forward escape chamber. So that's where I've shown it. I may be wrong. After all, this is a story of, of human error and human frailty. People get things wrong. But I think I'm right. Now, they were at sea. They had 103 people on board. The normal crew would have been 50-something. Depending on the source you go to, you'll get a different number. Wikipedia says 59. A BBC article says 51. 50-something. <clears throat> crew plus there were other boats being built alongside Thetis <clears throat> and some of the officers from those boats were on board also on board was the commander of the flotilla that Thetis was to join a fellow by the name of Captain Orham the captain of the Thetis was Lieutenant Commander Bolus Bolus was in charge the boat was owned by Camel Laird Shipyard they had yet to hand it over to the Navy 
this was part of the sea trials. They had done a sea trial already and they discovered the steering had been wrongly connected when they turned to port and went to starboard and vice versa. So that had to be abandoned and corrected. This was the, the sea trial in which they were going to try the diving. They had uh, two caterers on board as well because they were going to have food. There was basically a day trip. Um, they were going out in the morning and they were going to come back in the evening. There is a film called Morning Departure, by the way. Um, and Morning Departure, the movie, is based on a stage play that is very loosely inspired by the Thetis incident. So don't look to Morning Departure as a factual telling of the tale. It's quite different. <coughs> so they set off into Liverpool Bay. They were going to do uh, diving trials. They found that she was very light. They could not get her to dive. So they had to consult the trim chit. The trim chit, trimming a submarine is like a, an art form. Um, you have to take into account the fuel being used, the salinity of the water, the temperature of the water, the food being consumed, the amount of people on board as they change, as torpedoes are fired, uh, constantly balancing trim tanks, which are separate to the main ballast tanks, just keeping the submarine level. Um, so they were looking at this trim chair, trying to figure out why was she so light? Why wasn't she diving even with all the, all the men on board? Practically twice the number of men that should have been on board not in, under, under normal circumstances. Now, there was a, a, a boat called the Grebecock, a tug alongside, uh, a tender basically look, looking after accompanying Thetis on this, this sea trial. And it was expected a lot of the men would get off onto the Grebecock. But uh, the pilot didn't even want to get off. Everybody wanted to stay on and experience uh, diving in a submarine. Mm -hmm. Now, things went wrong. Going to sea in a submarine is a bit like a cross between seafaring and going to space. All the risks of seafaring, plus you're sealed into a metal tube in a harsh environment where things, things going wrong can be serious and there'll be nobody there to help you. So uh, on this particular voyage, things did go wrong and they went wrong with the safety mechanisms that were supposed to keep them safe. One of the things that was noticed when they looked at the trim chair was that tube five and six, the lower two tubes in the forward, in the torpedo compartment, were listed as being flooded. But the Camel Air people on board suggested that their understanding was that they weren't flooded. So there was a query about that. The man in charge of the torpedo compartment at the front of the boat was an officer called Lieutenant Woods. Now, Lieutenant Woods, that was his kingdom. He was supposed to be in charge of that and checking that out, making sure everything was right. There was a question mark about whether or not there was water. The tubes were flooded five and six. So he went to check. There are test cocks on the back of the torpedo tubes that allow you to check is there water inside or not. He found some in, in, in number six. He didn't find any in number five. He then started examining the tubes. He opened them all. And when he got to number five, the lever was very solid, wouldn't, wouldn't budge. He was detailing a, a leading seam in Hambrook to open the tube. Hambrook had to use his feet to try and get the lever to work. When it eventually did, it burst open. It was open to the sea. The bow cap was open. The Irish Sea rushed in under tremendous pressure, knocking them off their feet. They struggled to get up. There was no chance of them closing the door with the force of the water coming in. The compartment began to fill rapidly. The boat began to tip down. They all abandoned the forward torpedo compartment and went back into the torpedo stowage compartment. In the torpedo stowage compartment, they struggled to close the door. The, sh the boat was tipping down. There was all the tables and food that had been set up there because it was empty of torpedoes. That was where they were going to eat. They were going to have grub later, um, some sort of buffet meal. There were two caterers on board, as I said. All that was pressing down on the doors they were trying to close. The door they were trying to close was hanging forward. There was a lot of weight on it. They were trying to pull this up. They had great difficulty closing the door. They realised, or Woods realised, that if the water kept coming back, it was going to go down into the batteries. And seawater and batteries create chlorine gas, 
well-known hazard on submarines. So he was very concerned about that. They, were, they couldn't close the door. They got back into the next compartment and sealed it there. The ship was heading down to the bottom. Nose heavy, filling with water in four or two compartments. Tetis, like a lot of submarines, was designed to be buoyant with one compartment flooded, not two. So she ended up on the bottom. So let's look what happened there. The bow door, the bow cap on tube number five was open to the sea. These tubes are numbered, uh, looking at it from the inside, they're lumber, numbered 214365. It would have been so much handier if somebody had numbered them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because um, the way the gauges are laid out is a little confusing. Uh, the, the, the dials for the bow caps but I guess somebody at some point must have looked at the submarine drawing from the outside and numbered them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and they were stuck with that I guess the bow, cap, the bow cap indicators are in a line down the middle in between the tubes at the forward end and they are in sequence 2, 1, 4, 3, 6, 5 they indicate whether or not a bow cap is open using a dial and they can, they're can they not all consistent. Um, I've shown a simple diagram to try and illustrate this. They are, uh, if they're all closed, you're not going to see a load of needles in the same position. To make it worse, bow cap number five indicator is behind a metal bar now, I have no idea the size of it. I've, I've indicated an obstruction there. I understand if you're standing back at the rear of the torpedo tubes, you cannot see the indicator for number five. You have to move forward to see it. Woods was adamant afterwards that he checked the, the indicators and all the bow caps were closed. He also said he asked leading seaman Hambrook, who he was working with, <coughs> who told him all the bow cap levers were showing shut. The levers that operate the bow caps had three positions, open, shut and neutral. Prior to this, submarines had open and shut, British submarines. Now, Lieutenant Woods and Hambrook had served together before, so they knew each other. They, they knew how to work with each other. They, they, knew, they knew the routines. Hambrook was asked by Woods, did the bow cap levers show shut according to Wood's evidence later and he said they did but in fact they showed neutral now the reason there was a neutral position rather than open and shut was if you had a leak by having the levers in neutral you isolated the two circuits that either opened or closed the bow cap doors so you wouldn't be losing hydraulic fluid all the time so the neutral was basically a way of isolating those circuits. And what people were in the habit of doing, what was done on, on this submarine, was to use the lever to open and then return it to neutral when the operation was finished and close it. And after the, a minute or whatever it would be, you'd put it back. So um, they gave no indication of the state of the bow cap, which was one problem. The bow cap indicator when the submarine was recovered, showed shut for number five. Showed, I beg your pardon, showed open for number five. Woods was adamant, he checked them and they said shut. The second little piece of safety gear that would have indicated a problem was the test cock on the rear of the tube. Now, um, the rear of the tubes, th there's two, two levers. One big lever for actually opening the tube. The other lever is a smaller lever involved with the locking mechanism and also contains the test cock. There are two, uh, there are two videos, two, two documentaries you can see on YouTube. Uh, one is a British TV documentary and one is an American TV documentary. The American one is from a series called Disasters of the Century. The, uh, the British TV one, um, the guy who posted it suggests it's BBC. I'm not so sure. I didn't see any BBC logos anywhere on it. But um, the, B the British one, shows this test cock as if it was a piece of pipe with a little tap on the end, the kind of thing you'd see on the end of a putchine still or a moonshine still, allegedly. And uh, 
obviously in a confined space with people moving heavy weights on chains six of these little tubes sticking out of the torpedoes torpedo doors doesn't sound, seem very sensible so it was not like that at all uh, there was actually a lever on the back of the door a small lever and if you move the lever two holes lined up and if there's water inside the water would come out now Woods checked these before he opened them no water came out of number five when he opened the rear door the Irish Sea came in what had happened was these had been painted and the paint had sealed the inside hole so afterwards there was a lot of questions about how these came to be blocked there was a subcontractor who painted these torpedo tubes the inside of the torpedo tubes were painted with were, there was a, a substance called bitumastic which I presume is something like a cross between bitumen and mastic and this bitumastic was coated the tubes were coated with this and then there was a hard bonding layer of enamel put over the bitumastic and this was to create a very smooth surface for the torpedoes to to leave with nothing there'd be no rust there'd be no plant growth there'd be no you know there'd be nothing it'd be easy to clean it would be like an enamel bath for all the world as i understand it um i'm not sure the color now would be white but it would be it would be a uh, smooth smooth finish apparently when this job was done there was a, a company called uh, Wales Dove who were a subcontractor to Camel Laird um, they were three prices were got and these guys were always understood to be getting the job which is nothing odd if that's not unusual or sinister or anything and um, it's quite normal if you're dealing with subcontractors that you would have a favorite subcontractor somebody you knew could do the job do it well you could talk to them you could trust them if there was an issue it would be resolved it wouldn't be a fight about money and um, people would often get three prices just to keep everybody honest but would know where the job was going that's not unusual or sinister and um, two men came down they painted the tubes one guy was applying the bitumastic the other guy um, which had to be heated and applied and the other guy was doing the enamel paint uh, finish inside and the tube got blocked the guy doing the the work said he would use some uh, waste cotton and some grease and block the tube block the, the the hole and then paint and remove that it was found to be blocked with enamel the test cock hole whether he didn't block it or not is unclear um, the evidence is conflicting in the inquiry as to the overseer Grundy an Admiralty overseer who said that he came along and he found that the tubes had been painted the rear doors hadn't and he had requested that they be painted and was expecting to be called back to check them and he never got the call back the painters claim no he came along and inspected them so there's a discrepancy there and then maybe he did inspect them but not quite when they were finished um, maybe both people are remember we're remembering it differently and uh, the same event but there's a certain discrepancy about that if you look at the American documentary there's a camel aired worker who says the tubes the hole was blocked with cotton wool and grease um, everybody else says it was blocked with enamel the test cocks are kept clear using a reamer I've seen this spelled three different ways R-I-M-E-R -E seems to be the most common and basically this is a thin metal rod that you would poke through those holes and make sure they're clear um, Lieutenant Woods did not use this reamer it was not the drill it was not part of the drill for opening a torpedo tube um, it was more he he said and it was unchallenged in the inquiry that his training did not ever include using that reamer as part of opening the door in his career to that point three or four years in on submarines that was used as part of normal housekeeping it was done to periodically and and frequently done to clear those holes to check there was no buildup of silt or seaweed or anything blocking them 
um, it was not done prior to opening a torpedo tube. And when you think about it, if these tubes were to be opened, the drill for opening and reloading a torpedo would be uh, in battle conditions when time was very important. So rather than do that as part of the drill, it was done in between uh, regularly as housekeeping, just to make sure the holes were clear. Woods probably would have had no reason to think that a brand new submarine that had been handed over by the builders and checked and signed off by Admiralty overseers would have needed to have that housekeeping done. Any housekeeping would have been the responsibility of Cam Laird, who still technically still owned the boat. So some of the criticism levelled at Woods for not using that reamer, I think, is probably unfair as well. I have seen criticism of Woods for actually opening the door. Um, they're saying, why did he do it? Why did he need to open the door? I think maybe that's a bit harsh. Um, that was his kingdom. That was his area of responsibility. He was the torpedo officer. He was supposed to know everything about this room, this compartment. He was supposed to be able to go back at the end of the day and say that everything was fine. Suppose the painting error had been different and there was a patch of rust inside where it was never painted. Uh, and Woods was asked, well, why didn't you cop that? He, oh, I never opened the tubes. Opening the tubes in a, torpe in a torpedo, opening torpedo tubes in a submarine uh, isn't that big a deal um, normally. Once Woods had instructed Hambrook to open the rear door of tube number five, the water coming in was unstoppable. They got back into the next compartment. They never tried to close the bow cap door. Woods said he was convinced the doors were closed. When the water was coming in, he was certain there must be a fracture in the tube and that there was no point in doing anything other than get out and close the door. They had big trouble closing that door to that compartment. The doors originally were designed to have a one movement closing mechanism, a ring that you turn that would dog all the, the hatch all around. There were four doors in between the torpedo compartment and the torpedo storage compartment and the torpedo tubes. Two low level ones for the torpedoes to go from the storage, which was the, the floor was higher in the compartment behind. So in the floor, there were two torpedoes and two doors. They could be passed through into tubes five and six. Above that, then there were two doors at either side, uh, port and starboard, two, two doors, two hatches. Instead of having a ring to turn them and close them, they had 18 bolts with butterfly nuts. There was a hasp with a slot that would be folded over, the bolt would go into that, and then the butterfly nut would be done up. 18 of them. They were doing this with the boat tipping down, the door was hanging away from them, they had tables and food and everything piled forward at the forward end of that compartment, they had water rushing through. Then the water shorted something and the lights went out and they were trying to close this door. They were trying to close the door. They didn't realise that one of the bolts had fallen and was catching between the combing and the hatch itself. So they could not get it to the hatch, that final bit closed to allow them to close the bolts. They were very aware the water was coming into the second compartment. They couldn't stop it coming in. They decided to abandon that compartment. Thetis was on the bottom. Inside the submarine, there was two other submarine captains and there was the flotilla commander who was an experienced captain. So you had those two captains from two T-class boats that were being built alongside Thetis. You had Commander Orem, the, the, the Captain Orem, the flotilla commander, and you had Lieutenant Commander Bolus, who was the captain of Thetis. So they put their heads together and tried to figure out what they could do. Blowing the water out of the forward compartments seemed to be the answer. Now that was going to mean running airlines from tanks 
in the boat to the forward compartments so they got the camel aired men working on doing that they decided they would get somebody in to close the actual uh, to close the rear door of tube 5 to close the door a number 5 tube meant using the escape chamber the forward escape chamber as an airlock because the escape chambers they coincided with bulkheads and they had a door on either side so you could access them from either side and the hatch was in the the hatch for escaping was in the top so you could use this as an airlock and get from the, the dry area into the flooded area so Woods obviously anxious to put things right in his torpedo room torpedo compartment him and another sailor got inside they flooded up but the other sailor could not hack the, the pressure increase his ears were bursting he, he was in terrible pain so they hammered and had it flooded down and drained down they got out uh, another sailor got in and tried it Woods tried again the water was freezing as it flooded up and it was some task they were facing they were going to somebody presumably Woods was going to get out go through the torpedo pedo storage compartment flooded undo the clip on that door get through into the torpedo compartment go down the little ladder get to the torpedo tube number five seal that make their way back get back into the torpedo compartment uh, into the escape chamber and wait for it to be drained down now they were going to do this using davis escape equipment the Davis uh, DSEA kits and they were designed for uh, escaping from the submarine they had a small container of oxygen and a small uh, amount of chemicals that would deal with the carbon monoxide that was generated uh, they were for short-term use so the two men got in and uh, the second attempt failed same thing the second man couldn't hack the pressure I think they tried a third time and gave up after that so they decided the thing to do was get somebody out and get uh, outside assistance at this stage uh, it was getting on towards towards nightfall towards evening um, they couldn't be found there was planes looking for them uh, there was ships being sent uh, nobody could tell where they were a, an aircraft saw a shadow in the water uh, thought they saw a boy a boy was reported as well now afterwards people speculated as to whether or not these were fishing boys whether it was a different wreck but the plane reported uh, a location and uh, the pilot then or the navigator then corrected his original report and the, the the second one may have been an error but they ended up looking seven miles away from where Thetis was so Thetis spent the night on the bottom the plan was that they would expect surface vessels to come to their aid they would get airlines down and they would use the airlines that the surface vessels brought to blow out the forward two compartments one of the problems was the hatch for loading torpedoes this hatch was designed to take a lot of pressure from the outside it didn't apparently didn't even have any clips on the inside it was just expected that uh, its weight i guess i don't know was going to keep it closed but uh, if they were going to pressurize the compartment to drive the water out then they were going to have to secure that hatch otherwise any pressure going in would just bubble out through the hatch would lift the hatch so they decided that they would make a, a message instructions for the surface vessel somebody would escape carry this message strapped to their body in case they died and their body was found the the message would indicate what was needed to be done they wanted a strong back made which is a, a thing that you can fix to the back of a hatch to prevent it opening and they wanted uh, airlines and they indicated where they wanted those airlines attached um, but there was no point going out uh, at night time um, if nobody knew they were there that would be the same as jumping off the back of a ship in the middle of the night you're doomed so in the morning they decided they would use the rear escape chamber they would they would shift all the uh, the weight to the uh, to the front of the of the submarine they would lighten the rear they would move all the stuff around in their tanks they would dump fuel they would do everything they could to lighten the stern of the submarine get that near the surface and use the stern escape chamber 
which is what they did. They got it up to the surface and uh, at one point they actually thought the, the escape hatch might be above the surface, but it wasn't. It was about 20 feet below. Uh, two men, the flotilla commander, Captain Orm and Lieutenant Woods were the two men picked. Captain Orm had the notes uh, affixed to his body uh, somewhere and uh, they had they covered themselves in grease like transatlantic trans cross-channel swimmers. They got into the rear chamber. They got in because of the way that of the angle using the door, uh, the weight of the door meant they got in from the steering gear compartment. They flooded up the chamber. They opened the hatch at the top. Daylight came in. The, the men inside looking through the, the little holes, glass holes in the the two holes. I've shown them in the side, but it's probably in the. Uh, pretty sure they were in the doors, not in the in the side. Men looking in could see could see daylight which was a great boost. And the two men then were able to get out and make it to the surface. Now, just prior to them leaving, everyone on board heard a series of explosions. These were charges dropped in the water by a vessel that had actually found them. So it was a, they were delighted. They had been found. There was a vessel standing by. The men got out, swam to the surface. They were picked up. They were a bit shook. The air on Thetis, under normal circumstances, with the crew of 56 or 7 or whatever it was, they would have expected 36 hours of air, with twice the number of people on board, 18 hours was expected. I've shown a drawing here, um, if this is the scale, one man to scale, this is what 103 looks like. Um, I know the submarine has width as well as length, but if they all stood in a line, shoulder to shoulder, this is what it would look like. So they were short on air. Like in Apollo 13, it wasn't just the lack of air was the problem. It was the fact that they were producing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a killer. Carbon dioxide affects you severely before it kills you. Um, severe headaches, great difficulty in concentrating and the effects of the carbon monoxide were evident on the two men who got out. Nevertheless, they managed to explain the plan to the men on board. The, they were taken to Brazen, HMS Brazen, a destroyer that had been going down the Irish Sea when she got the word to make way at full speed to try and find Thetis. A big effort was taking place to get people to side, there was ships, there were salvage experts, there were naval staff, uh, all gathering at the side of Thetis. Um, after the two men came up, they all stood back. They were expecting more to come. They thought people would be popping up every few minutes. On Thetis, they were very conscious of time running out. Lieutenant Commander Bolas knew that if he put two men in and it took them about 10 or 15 minutes to fill that chamber and drain it down afterwards and get two more men in, that they were not going to get everybody out. There, there was going to be a lot of men dead. He decided to try four men. They put four men in. Now, this chamber, this escape chamber is a little bigger than a shower cubicle. Like, two men is a tight fit. Four men was a very tight fit. And they put four men in. They struggled to open the hatch. They couldn't move. They... They were, they were a long time in there and eventually the men outside said, this isn't working, we'll drain this down and get them out. Three of them were dead at that stage. They had drowned inside. They had been unable to operate the hatch and get it out. They uh, got the men out. One man, the, the, the fourth man, before he died, he was able to, to get across that they had just struggled and been unable to open the hatch. This was a bit of a, a blow to morale. Uh, the, the four bodies were, were stashed in the uh, machine spaces and uh, two more men were picked to leave. Now, one was a, it was decided they'd go in pairs. They'd have a Navy man who had been trained, some mariner who had been trained in escape alongside a shipyard worker who hadn't been trained. So they'd go in pairs. Navy man and shipyard man. So there was a stoker and a fitter went in next and they drained, they filled the tank, they opened the hatch, they saw daylight, they got out. It was all good. 
inside the submarine they were able to close the hatch down and they made a crucial mistake the escape compartments are set up so that they can be operated from three positions either side of the bulkhead or else inside by the men inside when somebody leaves through the hatch the men in the submarine were able to close the hatch down then drain out the chamber and get people in and by the way talk about things going wrong on one because of the angle the boat was at though that aft aft chamber when they drained that down at one point and um, the drains did not drain away into a tank they just drained onto the floor onto the floor and with the angle that the boat was at the water ran down and got into electrics and started an electrical fire which did not help with that acrid smoke in the in the the horrible in atmosphere they were in but the key thing was anybody was able to operate the wheels that would close the hatch down after somebody had escaped unfortunately to make sure that everybody could then use the equipment after you used a wheel to close the hatch you had to return that wheel to the end of its travel and that would allow then everybody else have control of the hatch what happened was after the last two men got out somebody only returned that by one revolution the next two men got in waited drained down at this stage now things were pretty bad men were unconscious men were in great pain with headaches men were nauseous this pair it flooded they opened the hatch it moved three or four inches and would go no further they hammered they hammered they pushed and pulled they did everything they could they could see daylight they could see the surface 20 feet above them they could not get out they closed it again drained down and went back into the the hell that was inside and um, on the surface people were getting cables onto thetis they uh, they got a man onto the uh, onto the the, the stern uh, a fellow called brock he was sort of a, a wreck master a uh, salvage expert and they were thinking about trying to get into the submarine through z tank and he was able to undo an outer hatch revealed an inner hatch on the pressure hull uh, of the tank sorry and when he undid those bolts there was a massive release of air under pressure so he tightened that up again quickly and went back to the ship to figure out what was going on because he didn't know was that good or bad or was it doing harm or what and um, the tides were a problem uh, the tides were shifting Thetis they were getting a line onto Thetis and trying to pull it so that it would pull upright but it was pivoting on its nose with the tide and it was very difficult to manage this um, the idea of raising a, a sunken vessel normally you would get things they call camels either side of it these are like big barges that could be sunk and then blown out and raised to, to lift things uh, they could be used as buoyancy aids they, these camels what are normally what you would put either side of a wreck that had been raised they hadn't got them to sight um, they didn't even think they had time to do anything like that they were just trying to pull it up so they could get it high enough that they could get in and get the men out um, the detail uh, and, and the, the arguments that went on over that rescue effort I'm not going to get into they're in the books the books detail that very well they were looking at maybe drilling through Z tank if they got that hatch open maybe drilling into that tank there was all kinds of rods and pistons and, and structural strengthening rods inside it would have been very difficult to get men out but they might have got an airline in and taken out the bad air and pumped in fresh air um, and maybe started working on getting men out that was something they were hoping to do but they were expecting fully expecting a series of escapes to be happening every few minutes 15 minutes or so didn't happen at one point somebody tried to leave had the same problem opened the hatch three or four inches would go no more closed it tried to get back into the submarine and the door into the steering compartment was opened while the, they were still 
the sea cock, the, 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 the chamber was still open to the sea, was still filling. Instantly, the steering gear compartment flooded. The submarine went down, cables parted, and she sank to the bottom again, and that was the end. 99 men in there. They had all at that stage retreated to the after sections. They were in about 30 in the steering gear compartment, about 60 in the engine room. Thetis was left on the seabed for oh, quite a while until they could get a, a salvage effort in place. They got uh, these camels that I spoke about. They, they managed to get her ashore and beach her. They, uh, the way they did that was they got cables underneath. At low tide, they tightened all these cables. Then the tide would lift the camels, which would lift Thetis. And then they'd tow those to the shore as much as they could while the tide would allow them. When the tide dropped it again, they would wait till the next low tide, tighten all the cables, wait for the next high tide, uh, tide to lift and move with the high tide. It took nine or ten lifts to get it to the beach. They left it there for quite a while. Day trippers and, and, and curious onlookers would be wandering around the outside of the submarine. Inside, the men awaited recovery. Eventually, it was brought around to a dry dock in Hollyhead. Camelaird refused to have it back and the men were taken out by a team of mines rescue people. Uh, volunteers from Mines Rescue People. Although one of the books does say actually Hollyhead policemen did did a lot of it. Um, there's so much stuff you find when you look into this that differing differing uh, accounts of what happened. The books are very good at getting into the inquiries. Basically, there was two inquiries: a confidential internal Navy one that pointed the finger at Woods and Seaman Hambrook for allowing this to happen. The public inquiry basically was under pressure not to find anybody responsible and didn't. It listed a series of things that, a series of failures that allowed this to happen. Um, there is uh, lately some people uh, cherry picking that list and suggesting that the inquiry was blaming the crew themselves for their own deaths, which, which isn't a fair interpretation I think of that inquiry and the way that list of failures was listed uh, it wasn't implying uh, guilt or anything to the crew the way uh, I've seen an aggrieved family member talking about it um, my opinion purely my opinion but um, there were a lot of failures listed failure to failure of the rescuers to rescue them is, is listed just as prominently as failure of the crew to be able to escape so the, they eventually they recovered the bodies. Thetis was cleaned out, deodorized, uh, examined, um, refitted, and went back to sea as HMS Thunderbolt. She had a good war record and was eventually, uh, unfortunately, sunk for the second time by the Italians in the Mediterranean. After Thetis, a lot was learned. Um, the, the Admiralty had, had, uh, had taken the attitude that submariners would always have to get themselves out. The idea of, of salvaging a submarine, or salving as the, they were calling it back then, that was the verb from which salvage comes. But I think now we'd use salvage as a verb. Salvaging or salving a submarine was not to be uh, considered the proper response to a sunken submarine. One consideration was if that was if that was uh, if that was taken to be the way to do it, then men would be reluctant to escape. They'd wait rescue. Um, there was a lot of risks involved in escaping from a submarine. There was a submarine in the Thames Estuary where the men escaped, got to the surface, and, and eventually died of drowning and exposure because nobody knew they were there. So the Admiralty had did a few rethinks after this. It's worth noting that uh, the men on Thetis never tried to escape using the forward escape chamber, presumably because they thought it was not feasible being down so deep. 
uh, they had only trained at shallow depths themselves. Uh, subsequently, the Admiralty built the large submarine escape tower at Gosport and were able to train people to escape from uh, much greater depths. One of the things that was introduced was a Thetis clip uh, on the back of a torpedo tube door. It meant that uh, this clip could not be opened until the door was open a fraction. So you would open the door a fraction, then remove this clip. If you open the door that fraction and water started pissing out around the edges, you, you knew something was wrong and you could close it again. I believe it's bad luck to refer to it by the name Thetis clip on board, but uh, it's been on every submarine since, every British submarine since. Uh, the escape compartments uh, were done away with and later on they developed these uh, trunks that went around a hatch in a normal compartment and the trunk would would descend, would be fitted around the hatch, descend into the compartment, the compartment would be partially flooded and then men would duck under and escape through the trunk. Um, I don't know the details of that, look into it if you want. And, uh, and anyway, listen, that's the, I guess that's the story of HMS Thetis and what went wrong. Um, there are books about this now. The first book that was produced, The Admiralty Regrets, C.E.T. Warren and James Benson. Um, that gets, I think, a couple of things wrong, but in general is a, a good account of it. Um, there's a book by Tony Booth called Thetis Down, which is very good and, and looks at uh, all the inquiries uh, and what came out there. Um, good photographs there too. And Thetis, the submarine disaster. David Paul which is also a, re a recent book and looks at uh, the, the detail, the documentary detail that's available. There's good photographs there too. Um, there's another book called Thetis Secrets and Scandal and that, uh, that looks at uh, whether or not the, the confidential admiralty inquiry could be regarded as a cover-up. Um, and also uh, there's been suggestions lately um, that maybe the Admiralty was reluctant to allow them to drill into the submarine because with air, air hoses for the men, because that would ruin the integrity of the hull and make it vulnerable, even if repaired, would make it vulnerable if it was depth charged later on. And of course, war was looming at this stage. Britain lost something like 70 or 80 submarines during the war. And, um, you know, what the, the war started not too long after Thetis. The war was in, was actually on. Britain had joined the Second World War before they got the bodies out. So, um, one thing I like about Tony Booth's book is the fact that he lists the dead at the end, but not just the dead. If you look at something like uh, the TV series Band of Brothers, great TV series, at the very end, they show you what happened to all the survivors. That tells you what they went on to do, what businesses they got into, or whatever, which is all very understandable and uh, and uh, of human interest and all that. Uh, completely understandable. But I remember seeing, th at the, thinking at the time, it's a bit unfair on the dead. Their families have to deal with uh, an awful lot, and they weren't mentioned at the end. Um, so I was delighted to see Tony Booth here. He lists the dead, but he also lists who they left behind. And I'm just going to read a couple of samples here. Um, you know, they say there are two deaths. The first time is when you really die, and the second time is when somebody uses your name for the very last time. Uh, so if you do read the books, do read the names. Um, Dylan Shallard, Harold J, Chief Stoker, husband to Mabel and father of Harold, age seven, and David, age five. Hill Albert. Admiralty Overseer, son of Elizabeth, husband to Ethel and father of Leslie, aged 12, and Peter, aged 8. Jackson, Stanley, engineer, captain, son of Thomas. Just a few examples. They all left a lot of people behind. A lot of people uh, badly affected. There was a, a lot of people gathered outside the Camelair shipyard gates like something you'd see at a, at a mine disaster. Um, 
There was legal cases taken. There was trouble with the union at Camel Laird uh, and they were representing their workers who died. There was a case taken against Commander Bolas's wife by the family, Lieutenant Commander Bolas's wife, by the family of one of the dead sailors. I think even some, I think even possibly leading Seaman Hambrook might, his family might have been sued by a family of another victim, um, which is kind of strange. The public inquiry found it was a negligent free accident. There was no negligence involved because nobody could have foreseen anything that happened. Um, so all the legal things basically were buried as well. Ran in, they ran into the sand as far as I understand, but the books give you a good indication of that. So that's the story of HMS Thetis. Bear in mind, as I say this to you now, that there are hundreds if not thousands of men right now sealed in metal tubes far beneath the waves in submarines. So spare a thought for them. I hope you got something from that now. <clears throat> I hope I brought some clarity, maybe, hopefully. And uh, maybe I'll see you again. Goodbye now. Mind yourselves. <laughs>